If a modern society is to survive, it needs money. Among the many other difficulties the United States endured, including the value of paper money, slavery, requirements and expectations of a government which could collect taxes, provide a justice system, had no permanent military protection as the British and Spanish troops continued to reside in American territories, the Declaration of Independence wasn't set in a way to function as a civilization just yet. While faith battled the emotional consciousness and logical creativity, the philosophical theory would need a practical plan to make things work. This transition was famously coined by John Fiske in his 1888 book, The Critical Period of American History, who argued that America was at its bleakest hour and almost didn't survive. More recently, other historians argued the transition wasn't the doomsday as John Fiske claimed, despite the economic depression the New Republic acquired. As long as people held on to faith, things would work out over time. It was like mending old clothes with new fabrics, sewing holes in the meantime, and yet needing to come up with another pattern without referencing to the original designs, since the traditional ones didn't fit anymore. Even though both New Englanders and Southerners suffered financial loss and overwhelming debt after the war, their economic problems differed a bit based on two separate commerce. One grew with the Industrial Revolution, despite the nation still being mostly an agrarian society, while the other overindulged the lands with slavery. It would be this difference which would persist well into the 21st century, and the busters would end up mending both sides. Paying off the war debt proved to be a laborious affair. The overall debt sat at $54 million plus interest and then added another $25 million for each state to help share the burden. At the time, foreign credit wasn't an option. Despite that profitable states like Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina had already paid their fair share, they were, however, required to pay more through taxation to bail out the other states. These states objected wholeheartedly. I have ever been of opinion that the governments of particular states ought to be supported in their full vigor, as the security of the civil and domestic rights of the people more immediately depend on them, that their local interests and customs can be best regulated and supported by their own laws, and the principal advantages of the federal government is to protect the several states in their enjoyment of those rights against foreign invasion and to preserve peace and a beneficial intercourse between each other and to protect and regulate their commerce with foreign nations. Once the agreement was made for this unified sentiment, there still was the question of how the national debt was to be paid. Alexander Hamilton devised a strategy beginning in 1787 for the states to make payment installments, which also included taxes, but to make the payment through tobacco and other exporting goods, since paper money declined in value due to the overprinting of the currency. The money raised would not solely be utilized for the debt, but likewise to better fulfill society by providing schools and civil servant incomes for their duties. All the while, the solution competed with the construction of the American Constitution as a means to build a functioning nation. The Virginians did not oppose their civic duties, but in 1788, some felt compelled to change how their taxes were to be paid. If their payments consisted of their precious tobacco, they would lose profit. Although paper money wasn't completely dead in spite of its barren value, a group of men from Albemarle County, both farmers and merchants, composed a petition in a hopeful plea that the House of Delegates to reconsider their payment options. Among the signers were Major Claudius Buster, his two brothers John and David, and his son Claudius Jr. Virginia wasn't the only state with this complaint. Ultimately, the Emmett Bill of the Articles of Confederation within the Constitution was rescinded, and in its replacement, Congress continued its borrowing on credit. The issues of paper monies for the United States would endure petty politics and inflation caused by wars and economic bubbles for many decades. It wouldn't be until the 20th century when the U.S. finally stepped into the world power limelight with the steel industry to finally print a strong currency and when paper could consequently beat rock even when the rocks were made of pure gold. In spite of the economic challenges during this transition, the Buster clan not only managed to sustain themselves, but William's children attained a comfortable living. 
William Jr. was the above average farmer in Virginia. Although not painfully wealthy, he was by no means breathing a modest lifestyle either. His plantation was large enough to subjugate 15 laborers and large enough to actually be categorized as a plantation. Farmers who could afford purchasing enslaved laborers on average would own one to four and work side by side with them in the fields. More than likely, this wasn't the case for William Jr. and to the point when he could afford to hire an overseer. Overseers would earn their wages based on the profit produced at the end of the season. So, as it was acceptable, the more brutal the overseers were as a means to force the Africans to work harder, the more money they hoped to partake. William Jr.'s wife and children need not to labor in the fields even if they may have fulfilled other minor chores around the house and farm. It was unseemly for well-to-do wives to work outside of the home, especially out in the open, harvesting crops. Because his wife, Jane, came from the prominent Woods family, he possessed the advantages of expanding his land with his father-in-law's financial assistance, fashioning him to be one of the most successful Buster brothers. Therefore, just after he resettled in what would become Wythe County, following his North Carolina experience, when he died, he was able to pass along his property to his wife and nine children in 1795. Wythe County had two renowned histories. One, the county was named after the first Virginia signer of the Declaration of Independence, George Wythe. So yes, Wythe had beat Thomas Jefferson to the punch, endorsing his legendary document, despite Jefferson being one of the five authors. Two, the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin, spent his younger years in Wythe. Austin's father, Moses, and uncle Stephen founded Austinville out of the high hopes to profit from the lead and zinc mines and for Moses to maintain his noble social status as the lead king. The Austin brothers instead accumulated more debt than minerals during their near decade venture and in order to avoid imprisonment after bankruptcy, they hightailed out of there to southeastern Missouri by 1798. That was just five years prior to the Louisiana Purchase. Odds of William Jr. running into George Wythe and the Austins during this period were very high, especially since William Jr. lived in Fincastle County before it became Montgomery County and then later divided into Wythe County to where Austinville used to hold the county seat. At one time, before 1790, Austinville in Fincastle County was a place to pay taxes and go to court thereby increasing the chances of William Jr. greeting and even perhaps exchanging polite conversations with his illustrious neighbors. About 190 miles east of Wythe County, Albemarle and Augusta counties supported the other four Buster brothers and the only sister, where they maintained their livelihood until their deaths. Major Claudius Buster purchased a well-established tavern in 1785, known as the D.S. Tavern, which was built in 1740, nestled in a small community of Ivy in Albemarle. Even in the Augusta County records, Claudius' last name was still spelled as Bustard. To be remembered, always, he carefully engraved his inscription, C. Buster, 1786 AD, on the tap bar cage, which was discovered during the renovation two centuries later. In the beginning phase, it was a simple one-room log structure in the shape of a capitalized I. But in order for it to become a profitable tavern, it was constructed into a two-story structure. So, by the time Claudius bought the place, he converted it into a typical two-story log house comprising of two brick chimneys. And as late as 1795, he extended the structure further by adding a double-layered porch, which equaled the length in the front, a distraction from the forest to entice weary travelers to stop into rest who were in dire need for taste of civilization. The lower floor had one entrance, casually hiding a bar room and sitting room. In between the dual rooms, cleverly posed a coarsely graded tap bar cage, a single staircase located in the sitting room with a quarter turn style used to lead guests up into two sleeping chambers but was later removed when made into a private home. The double sleeping chambers exposed conventionalized federal-style fireplaces. The entire structure displayed colonial six-panel doors with HL hinges guarded by box locks. 
women and children were allowed because, before the popularity of hotels, taverns provided food and lodging, as well as alcohol. When Claudius took over, he preserved the tradition of the Virginian taverns, also characterized as ordinaries, and ordinaries were a dime a dozen. In Ellis Lothrop's book, Early American Inns and Taverns, she quoted an early English traveler by the name of Mrs. Wakefield regarding the availability of taverns. We can scarcely pass 10 or 20 miles without seeing an ordinary. They all resemble each other, having a porch in the front, the length of the house, almost covered with handbills. They have no sign. These Virginia taverns take their name from the person who keeps the house, who is often a man of consequence. In spite of the competition, Claudius had one advantage over the others, location. Historically, the DS Tavern has been credited to being established by David Stockton, who carved his initials, DS, into a tree after parting ways with his partner, Michael Woods Sr. It was just the fill at home spot for travelers trekking westward, and David Stockton was known for chartering this prominent trail from Williamsburg to Goochland. Ivy continued to be the major turnpike for settlers passing through the valley to Blue Ridge at the junction of Three Notched Road and Richard Woods Road, facing west outside of Charlottesville. Claudius had made a very comfortable living. In addition to land he and his brother John purchased together based on the location and opportunities the tavern provided for the pioneering spirit. In fact, after the death of Claudius in 1807, and even after the Woods clan took over the tavern for a short time, including William Baptist Billy Woods and Magistrate Micaiah Woods, who then sold it to the Gooch family, descendants from Governor Gooch, the tavern maintained its public image until 1850. Due to its historical impact, the DS Tavern is now on the National Registry of Historic Places and had been since 1983, therefore outlasting many of the other ordinaries of post-colonial days of yore. Although the uncertainty of how the New Republic would cultivate and advance by Ben Franklin's ambivalent outlook, except for death and taxes, the upheaval did not hinder its people from living their lives. And not only did they live out their lives, they persisted in expanding their livelihood beyond their childhood boundaries. Virginia no longer could keep the busters in one place anymore. Whether inspired by adventure or promises of wealth in other states, they went westward.